course, there's that question that comes up. You know, what do you do? It, was, it happened to me yesterday at Home Depot. I was in line waiting for some paint and talking to a guy. And what are you over here for? And they said, well, I'm, you know, I'm a pastor at a church over here and stuff. And, and it's usually that response of dumbfounded, like, oh, no. What did I say? What have I done? Uh, oh, why, God, why? You know, uh, but they say, they often will, will say, well, you don't look like a pastor. <laughs> and out of curiosity, I'll simply respond, well, what does a pastor look like? I said, well, he's, he's, he's old. I said, well, I got some gray, you know. You know, he, he, he drives a, a couch car. I said, well, I got a little box car. Does that kind of work? And, you know, he wears a suit all the time. And of course, I'm wearing jeans and chucks. And they say, praise the Lord all the time. And they tell corny jokes. I said, well, I got the corny jokes down. I can do that real well. It comes from my dad. <laughs> I don't feel bad in a sense uh, because I understand Paul. When Paul came into Corinth, uh, he ran into a very similar situation. He didn't match up to the measure of the minister that the Corinth church wanted. They wanted a guy that uh, was very well known and a guy that would, would the world would look at and approve of and a guy that, you know, is just top, in a sense, top notch. And Paul comes with such a humble, simple approach when it comes to ministry, that in a sense, they were somewhat turned off by it. And so in chapter 4, Paul takes them back to some basics, the major of a minister. You might be thinking this morning, well, how does that apply to me? I see how it applies to you, but not me. Well, the reality is whether you are a, a parent or a pastor or just a person, when you interact with people as a believer, you are doing ministry. Well, that's not, that, that, that doesn't make sense. I mean, I'm just doing dot, dot, dot. Well, if it's unto the Lord, it's ministry. And so these characteristics, these principles come home to our hearts that we want to be effective for the Lord. We want to reflect the Lord in everything that we do. You see, in chapter 1, Paul had talked about this identity. that this, They were really having an identity crisis, this church, in the first four chapters. He tells us in chapter 1 our identity is found in Christ. He tells us in chapter 2 that our identity speaks about Christ. He tells us in chapter 3 that this new identity bears fruit to Christ. And now in chapter 4, he's telling us our identity is an example of Christ and how important it is. And so he breaks this chapter down. The first uh, uh, five verses talk about a faithful uh, steward and servant. The next verses 6 through 13, a fool for Christ. And lastly, he points out that he's like a father spiritually in verses 14 through 21. So let's look at this, starting in verse 1. Paul says, Let a man consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Number one, the minister in heart is a servant of Christ. And that's what he points out first and foremost in verse one. The Greek word is huperetos, and it means the under oarsman, the under rower. An under wearer wears an under rower, okay? And so he's down, you remember Ben-Hur, right? You remember that movie, and there's the guy, ba-boom, 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 and the guys are just rrr, rrr, rowing it out. That's the picture that Paul uses here, we are servants. We're at the bottom of the ship, simply rowing our way to get those on board to their heavenly harbor. You see, Jesus is the captain of the ship, not the ministers, not the, we're, we're at the bottom, just simply saying, hey, let's get those to the Lord. Jesus said it best, right? He said the greatest in the kingdom is what? Servant of all, right? That we're not to rule over with a heavy hand, but to come under and undergird that others may come to know Christ and live for Christ rightly. Peter understood this. He says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 and 3, he tells the elders there, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. 
And so a shepherd, a, a minister, wants to care and feed and even lay down his life for others. He serves willingly by example. He, he's not entitled to certain things, well, because I'm the pastor. No, there's no manipulation in the process for dishonest gain. He wants to just set the example. I remember one day a guy came in and we're a place to do community service and I was talking with him about, you know, life and, hey, where have you, where have you been? Have you done a few hours? Where'd you go? And he says, well, I was at this one church and, and all of a sudden they said, well, why don't you just go out and wash the pastor's car? And I thought, no way, really? They made you do that for community service hours? And he says, yeah, I was so turned off by it. I said, well, I pray you never experience that again. I mean, you can come and you can serve the church, you can serve the community, but you're not going to come and do my stuff. They want no manipulation and no misinterpretation uh, that we're here to serve and serve the Lord. Now, if you called me up one day and says, hey, I want to come over and wash your car, I'd say, hey, why not? <laughs> your initiative, not mine. <laughs> but uh, that's a whole other issue. But we have to ask ourselves, are we servants of Christ? How are we serving the Lord? And sometimes I found in my own life that when uh, it's a real test of my servanthood when you're actually treated like a servant, when you're not thanked, when you're not appreciated, when you're not patted on the back, oh, then becomes the time that sometimes the Lord has those people there in your life just to, and the Lord whispers in those moments to say, uh, you're a servant, right? Well, well, yeah, of course I am a servant, Lord, but come on, you know? No, no, no. Serve me in spite of responses. And you realize, oh, Lord, there's still a lot of work to do in my own heart. Make me a servant, Lord. I want to serve you. So the first thing, the minister in heart is a servant of Christ. Number two, you find in hand that he's a steward, as he says there in verse one, a steward of the mysteries of God. Now, the Greek word for steward is oikonomos, and it means a house distributor, a manager. In, in other words, uh, he doesn't own it. He just manages things. In the house of God. Think about Joseph in the house of Potiphar. He was a great steward, a great uh, person there to have responsibility and accountability, and there's a reward at hand. And, and so too, you and I, even as ministers and what God has called you to do, you simply know who the master is. You're in his house, and you take where his riches are in his word and give them out wisely and uh, prudently to people in his household. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 13, 52. Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. And you realize that God has entrusted you with some of his most precious things? It's kind of a heavy thing to think about. He's given you his gospel. He's given you how men need to be saved. He's given you, in a sense, uh, the, the church as a whole, his bride to minister in love. And we want to be careful that we see the high calling of what God's calling us to do, and we hold those things valuable. We don't abuse them. We don't manipulate them. We want to be found, as he says in verse 2, faithful in these things. Faithful. And faithfulness is required. It says, moreover, it's required in stewards that one be found faithful. You want to be faithful with what God has given you. It's an indispensable requirement, a non-negotiable in God's kingdom. It's not about how popular you are. It's not about your teaching experience and abilities. It's not about uh, you have a worldwide ministry. Well, that's the, the thing to, to go for. Can you be faithful to the Lord in what he's put in front of you? So often people are saying, oh, I want more, Lord. I want more. Well, if you're, are you faithful with the little that God's given you? I want more ministry. I want more of this. I want more opportunities. Well, have you used the opportunities? When you're faithful in the little, you prove yourself to then be faithful with something more, Lord, for your glory. So start that process. Be faithful in the simple things. So who determines faithfulness? Because ministers are constantly being critiqued and judged by people. So verse 3 and 4 is where he says, you know, it's not me. It's not you. It's the Lord. Uh, he is the one who judges me uh, in verse 4. I find in Acts chapter 28, you remember when Paul was shipwrecked on that island of Malta? He started to make his Malta meal and got a fire there. Got it going. He got bit by a snake as he's trying to serve people. Shakes it off into the fire. And what did the locals say? Oh, dude. This is my version. Dude. 
you must be a criminal, man. Gotcha. Justice served. Ba-boom. Bang. You're going down. And then when he didn't die, they changed their mind and said, oh, dude, you're a god. Rock on, bro. You know? <laughs> it, they, they, it, and it's like, how do you get that? You got to be careful. You serve the Lord and you keep him the focus and let him take you through those things. So in character, the minister is stable and confident in the Lord. Jesus is the judge we're accountable to. And we can stand in confidence before him and stability before him that through it all, he is our rock. The fourth thing we find there in verse 5 at the beginning is that in will, he's patient and trusting God to sort things out in his time. He says, therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bro bring both to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. You know, sometimes their judgment was all wrong of Paul, and sometimes we can jump to conclusions about people and cause a situation to be worse when in reality, 1 Samuel says, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart, right? We just don't know all the time. And so it's best to be patient and wait upon the Lord uh, when we need to, and trusting that God's going to work things out. To his own master, a person stands or falls, uh, and we want to be used by the Lord, but we need to be careful of taking it too far, making those judgment calls, rather than just saying, Lord, you're going to work it in the big picture. You're going to work it out in your time. The fifth thing he finds there is, is in verse, at the end of verse 5, he says, then each one's praise will come from God. And I love this because the minister needs to have a focus that is eternal, a heavenly mindset and goal. You need to have that. I need to have that. Not so concerned with man's praises. We're not after that. We're after the Father's words when he says, well done, good and faithful servant, right? That's what we want to hear on that day. So we want to be found faithful to Jesus and fruitful for Jesus and what he's put before us that we may uh, give glory to him on that day. So the minister is not only faithful servant and steward personally, uh, he goes into that he's also a fool for Christ publicly. Look at verse six. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one another, uh, uh, behalf of one against the other. Paul hopes that this letter that he's writing to the Corinthians will help them keep their thinking biblically and not go to extra biblical measures when thinking of what makes a good minister. Unfortunately, today we find sometimes that happening. He says, don't think beyond what is written. And some ministers or people will be judged, well, they're affected because, oh man, the guy is funny. Or the guy, look how he dresses. He dresses so sharp. Or you know what? He's a very marketable man. He needs to be, he's the guy. And all these things are not biblical. They're not biblical. And so he pulls them back. Make sure you have these things happening. Some judge a minister by his education or his appearance. But the Bible doesn't put forth those things. He took some pretty scoundrel guys and said, hey, walk with me and watch what I'm going to do through your life. And they changed the world. There was a, a church who put out an ad uh, in search. They said, wanted the perfect pastor. And I'll read it to you. He pleases everyone. He preaches exactly 20 minutes and follows it with an invitation in which everyone is convicted, but no one is offended. He works from 7 a.m. to midnight in every aspect of work, from counseling to janitorial work. He's 27 years old with 30 years of experience. He's tall and short, thin and heavy set, handsome but not overpowering. He's got one brown eye and one blue eye. His hair is parted in the middle and straight on one side and wavy on the other with a balding spot on top revealing his maturity. <laughs> Has a burning desire to work with teenagers and spends all his time with senior citizens. He smiles constantly with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him serious at his work. He invests 25 hours a week in sermon preparation, 20 hours in pastoral counseling, 10 hours in meetings, 5 hours in emergencies, 20 hours in visitation and evangelism, 6 hours in funerals and weddings, 30 hours in prayer, 12 hours in correspondence, and 10 hours in creative thinking, and is always available in his office. <laughs> By the way, that adds up to 136 hours a week. He always has time for all committees and activities of the church. He never misses the meeting of any church organization and is always busy evangelizing the unchurched. He has perfect kids. His spouse plays the keyboard. 
He is talented, gifted, scholarly, practical, popular, compassionate, understanding, patient, level-headed, dependable, loving, caring, neat, organized, cheerful, and above all, humble. And they said this, if your pastor does not measure up, simply send this notice to six other churches that are tired of their pastors too. Then bundle up your pastor and send them to the church at the top of your list. If everyone cooperates, in one week you will receive 1,643 pastor applicants. One of them should be perfect. Have faith in this letter. One church broke the chain and got its old pastor back in less than three months. <laughs> no one measures up to that. So Paul says, listen, here's what you need to measure a minister by. In verse six, he says, you got the who and the what. Who is that example? I've given you myself and Apollos. And what do you take it back as the standard? It's gotta be the scriptures. Taking it back to the scriptures. Is the word your standard? And so you don't think beyond what is written. A good minister will point out godly examples to follow and point you back to the scriptures to guide you. Uh, verse 7, he says there, For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? And every godly minister, yourself as well as I, recognizes that everything we do is simply from the grace of God. We're just the tool that he uses. God gets the glory for it all. Can you imagine for, and the, and the Corinthian church missed this, but can you imagine yourself going into surgery and you come out of surgery and you go to the table and you go, oh, knife, knife, oh, knife, how great you are. You're so sharp and shiny. Boy, the tool, that, the, the work that you did, oh, so amazing. Wow, thank you, knife. You'd say, you're a loon. He was just the tool. Go to the surgeon and tell him thanks. It was his hands and his work taking the process. How important that is. A good minister will walk in humility, pointing people up to the Lord and not himself. I think about John the Baptist. There in John chapter three, the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He said, a man can receive nothing except it be given to him from heaven. You have that mentality? Lord, it's all yours. And he goes on to say, he must increase but I must decrease. Lord, let people see you through my life more than even me. It's a good heart. There's no place for pride in the ministry, only praise to the Lord in ministry. Verse eight, he says there, you are already full, you are already rich, you have reigned as kings without us, and indeed I could wish you did reign, that we also might reign with you. Now the church had become popular in a sense in the world's eyes, and they began to think that they didn't really need Paul's help, and Paul in a very sarcastic way is basically telling them, oh, you're so important. Oh, I wish I could be like you. I wish I could reign with you in popularity contest and reign as kings while instead I'm thrown to the curb and created, you know, thrown into the lion's den, so to speak, by people. And he says through this passage here in the next couple of verses to remember how you got there. Paul was a servant, a steward, a fool for Christ, willing to go very low to lift them up. They stood on his shoulders. And the danger is that we get to a place in pride and self-sufficiency where we become blind to our true state. We begin to think, oh, I don't need any, any counsel. I don't need to hear from anything. Um, you begin to neglect the basics. You begin to neglect the foundation and pushing those things aside. And the reality is this. You and I can so easily become dull in heart, blind in eye, deaf in ear, for you remember when Jesus wrote to the church of Laodicea in Revelation, oh, he says, you, you say you have need of nothing. You, you're self-sufficient, but I'm gonna tell you something. You're poor, miserable, blind, wretched, and naked, so come back to me. How often the Lord can say that to us? Maybe even a brother or sister has come along in your life like Paul and has said, hey, what happened? Why are you doing these things? That's not what we started with. That's not how I, I showed you how to follow Christ. What happened? And those are those points to go, wow, Lord. You may speak through your word. You may speak in my heart. And sometimes you may use a brother or sister. But I want to have listening ears so that my faith does not grow dull. 
And Paul is here saying, listen, a good minister will sacrifice personally to bless the church. And so he lists all these sacrifices that him and the apostles had made so that this church could be established. Look at this. Uh, verse, verse 9, for I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. He says, number one, we've been sentenced by the world. We're men condemned to death. A spectacle is the word theatron, where we get our word theater. And they had been thrown in humiliation into the arenas to fight beasts as the main event and such. They had been captured and they had been condemned and killed. I think about James that was put to death with the sword or Peter that would be crucified upside down according to church history. He said, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as my Lord. Even Paul that would eventually be beheaded. For the truth of the gospel, that testimony, says, look, at the foundation, we are sentenced by the world, verse 9. Uh, verse uh, 10, he says, we've been scoffed at by men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. Labeled us, they've labeled us as fools, weak, and dishonored, but the Corinthian church became wise, strong, and distinguished. You realize Paul, as a rabbi, could have said, hey, you know what, I had the opportunity to go down those roads because I considered them nothing for the sake of just gaining Christ. And that's what I want. That's what I need in my life. And that's what we all need. I think about Jim Elliott who said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And he sacrificed his life in sharing the gospel with the Alka Indians down in Ecuador. But how true it is. You're not a fool to give up what you can't hang on to to gain what you're never going to lose. The Corinthian church was wise in their own eyes but foolish in God's for depending upon worldly ways and personalities rather than God's word. The Corinthian church boasted of being strong spiritually but truly they were weak by their fighting and boasting about who's a better teacher. The Corinthian church longed for the world to honor them and they were missing the honor that comes from God. And Paul says in verse 11, even more, he talks about the sufferings in life. He says now, um, he says, to the present hour we both hunger and thirst and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless and we labor working with our own hands. You see what he's getting at is it's not sometime in the past, it's in the very present hour we are facing some extreme difficulties for the sake of the Lord. They're in ragged clothes. They're beaten down. They're homeless in a sense. They don't have a roof over their head. They're laboring with their own hands. And the Greeks looked at manual labor as that's only fit for slaves. You, you mean your leader goes out and, you know, he's, he, he's working with his hands? Paul was do a tent making thing when necessary. How can he be your leader? Paul and the apostles were willing to suffer greatly that others may come to Christ and grow in Christ. It wasn't posh living in palatial palaces. They didn't have servants waiting on them, hands and feet. They were regular guys, regular men, and even women in the mix of ministry just saying, we want to serve Christ. We want to help others. We want to serve one another. They served God's people not for what they could get from them, but what they could give to them. And the sad thing I think today is that many churches in our culture can become much like the Corinthian church here. They're too concerned about the worldly image of success and power. Uh, the pastor doesn't lift a finger to do anything. He just tells people what to do. And that's not the example that Jesus set. And maybe it's the churches as they're teaching the health, wealth, and prosperity. And just like the Corinthian churches, that's what they wanted to be valued in the eyes of the world. And Paul says, wait a second, time out. Ministry is costly at times. Remember what we showed you, Corinth. And then in verse 12 and 13, he showed them real love. He says, when we are, um, it says, being reviled, what did they do? They blessed. Being persecuted and beaten down, they endured and they bared up underneath it. Being defamed or evil spoken of, we entreat or we, we prayed for you. You would think at this time that they would appreciate all the sacrifice that's been happening. The Greeks thought, man, you're not going to fight back. What kind of man are you? 
Paul says, listen, I'm going to pray for you. And you're going to continue to beat on and label and scoff at me. My prayer one day is that you would see the Lord who loves you. You'd think that, oh, they would appreciate these things, but nope. What does Paul say in verse 12? Verse, uh, yeah, he says, um, verse 13, we have been made as the filth of the world, the offscoring of all things until now. They, they treat us like garbage. The sad but real truth. You see, the test of true love is how you respond when others treat you wrongly. That's a real test for us. And Jesus set the example. As they crucified him, what did he say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Earlier in his ministry in the book of Matthew, he said, he said to, to love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. For then you're going to be sons of your Father in heaven. How will the enemies of God ever become the friends of God? Let me tell you, it's when you love as Jesus would when everything in your nature says not to. That's when the rubber meets the road. That's when we say, this is my opportunity, Lord, to show them who you really are. And God give us grace and help to do that. Am I loving sacrificing myself to build others up in the Lord? Am I loving even though I'm treated wrongfully by the ones I love or even the world? This last section, a faithful servant is, uh, a faithful minister is there serving personally, uh, a fool for Christ publicly, and he says in verse 14 through 21, a father, in a sense, spiritually. He says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I, I warn you. Paul didn't point out verses 9 through 13 to kind of one-up them in their boasting or to bring shame to them. He was warning them of prideful thinking that it's not right. It would be like a, a father sitting down with his kid, his immature kid, and saying, look, you need to listen up a little bit. You're going to head for disaster with that attitude. It's not right. It's not how I taught you or even showed you. A good minister, like a loving father, instructs others in the Lord. Verse 15, he says, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers for in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. And Paul wanted them to grow spiritually. He says, you might have 10,000 teachers or tutors. And every father wants their kids to say, hey, you know what? You may have other people that speak into your life and help you grow in the Lord. But you only got one person who is the father, in a sense, in that place. I encourage you parents who have kids Find two or three people that you trust to say, hey, can you be there in a sense as another voice for my kids as they grow older in life? Of course, the trust has to be established. The place has to be there. But there's times when even your kids won't listen to you, right? And you need to take a different approach. I think that's where the whole godparent thing came in. You know, you're not going to listen to me, so go next door and talk to Johnny. He'll set you straight. And you're trusting them. They're not going to abuse your kid, but they just need to hear it from a different angle. Having two or three parents, people that you trust to say, you know what, can I just lean on you to speak into my kid's life in those turbulent teen years? I need it. And they needed it too. How important it is. And as a parent, there's times to praise, time to correct, times to welcome, and times to warn. Uh, you don't stay away from hard things because uh, you know that some things are necessary for proper growth. Uh, love is tender, but love is also tough at times. And a good minister needs to act like a loving father to a loved kids, right? We need to do that, all of us. So a father not only instructs, as he says in verse 14 and 15, but he sets the example, verse 16, therefore I urge you, imitate me. He's begging them, imitate him. A father not only knows what's best, but he wants what's best, right? Father knows best. But it's not just, kid, go out and do what I'm, I didn't do. It's setting the example. And so that's what Paul is doing. He says, I've instructed you, and I've also set that example. Follow me as I follow Christ, he would tell them later in chapter 11, verse 1. 
In verse 17, he says, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. He couldn't be there, so he sent Timothy over there. And Timothy was, was uh, Paul's son in the faith, he calls him. He got saved on Paul's second missionary journey. And he, Paul took him with him and trained him in ministry. And so this man had walked with Paul for years. He knew Paul's heart inside and out. He was the best representation, so to speak, of Paul there to, to share the heart and do those uh, things that Paul would have done, though he couldn't be there. If there was one that could relay and remind them of Paul's ways, it was Timothy. But it reminds me of the fact that a good minister is willing to delegate out ministry. There are times when you can't do everything. You're not supposed to do everything. There's times when you need to stop what you're doing and definitely go and take care of something. But there's other times when you need to delegate it out to others to do it. And hopefully there's others that you trust that would carry your heart to do that aspect of ministry. And one of the things I love about our church is that whether it's men's or women's or hospital or powwow or whatever else is going on in children's or greeters, I can so be blessed to say, you know what? Go see them because I know they're gonna not only carry my heart, they're gonna push you to Jesus too. Sometimes people will call and they'll want to talk to the pastor when it comes to benevolence. And I'll pick up the phone and say, hey, you know what? Uh, you know, glad you called, but that's not my area. So I'm going to give you to Mikey. Well, that's his area. He's not here. I can say that. <laughs> it's a tough area. I did it for a long time. But it's trusting others that, you know, Paul says, Timothy, go. And you're going to represent my heart. And you're going to point people to Jesus. I delegate it out, and I trust you to do that. And that's the beauty of watching ministry unfold. A good minister will delegate the ministry out to others. So uh, in a sense, the father figure, he instructs, he sets the example, he delegates responsibility, and lastly, there's discipline when needed. He's not like the mother who told her st stubborn son, and hey, this is the last time I'm going to tell you for the last time. You ever been down that road? <laughs> it's the last time I'm saying this for the last time of the last time. One, two, three, <laughs> and you just start, <laughs> wait a second. Now he says, listen, there's, there's discipline needed. Just as it is in your family, discipline's needed when things get out of line. So even within the church, he says there in verse 18, now some of you are puffed up. You're prideful as though I were not coming to you. He wasn't afraid to come. He just couldn't. And it didn't justify their big heads. Oh, well, Paul, he, can't, he doesn't really know what he's talking about. Well, I think we know a little better. It's just this rebellious spiritual. You ever find in life that the stages of life are very reflective of the stages in your spiritual life? Let me, re let me relate it a little bit like this. When you're a kid, as a child, your parents know everything. You're very curious. Why? 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 Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> you go on the playground and, well, my dad told me so, so you're wrong, friend. Your parents know everything. When you hit the teenage years, well, your parents know nothing. You don't ask them because you think you're right all the time. When you hit the young adult years, your parents know some things. You're going to figure life out for yourself, and if you ever get stuck, Dad, need a ride. What do I do? When you get to be an adult, you realize your parents knew a lot of things. Hey, Mom. Hey, Dad, what do I do about this? And when you become elderly, you simply wish you could talk to your parents again. Sometimes we act like brats, whether in the home or even in the church. We go through those seasons. But what I love about Paul, as a good minister, he bears patiently with people as they grow up spiritually. We're not there yet. None of us are. And what a great example. But yet at the same time, he's willing to discipline. He's willing to poke them in the eyes. In verse 19, he says, But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. In time, Paul would be there, but let's see if their bite is worse than their bark. You, know, you say a lot when someone's not there, and when they show up, it might be a different story. And so he says in verse 21, or 20, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. 
Let's walk the walk and talk the talk. It's not about the words you say. It's the display of the Holy Spirit in your life. And of course, love is the result of those things. And then he closes out in verse 21 and he says, what do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? Boy, he's laying it down. Hey, I'm gonna leave the ball in your court, he says. You got a soft heart? You're gonna receive things and it's gonna be a blessing. But if you're prideful and puffed up and you got a hard heart, then I like a shepherd, I'm gonna come with a rod. Which do you want? Oh, love is seen in both ways. But there's time again that love is tender and the time that love is tough, right? Where did Paul get this from? I would propose to you that he saw the example in Jesus. Because what I love about Jesus is when he came across broken people, he didn't crush them down. He said, a broken reed I will not break off. A smoldering flax I'm not going to blow away. I'm going to bring it back to life. I'm going to stable it up. And when you are broken and have a soft heart towards the Lord, you are so ready to receive grace, grace, grace. But when your heart is hard towards God, bitter and angry, I'm doing things my way, God, guess what happens? Just like Jesus with the Pharisees, he's going to poke you in the eyes and you won't have time to throw that up. He is going to deal with you a little harsher in love trying to break the hardness of your heart. It's James that says this, God resists the proud, right? But gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, Peter said, and he will lift you up. So when you think about the big picture, you want to be a faithful servant and steward to the Lord. You want to example the humility and the love of Christ even when those around you who may love you or not don't appreciate it. And like a father to kids, you want to instruct an example and delegate and discipline when necessary. Let's pray. Father, you... Are